Thank you all for coming today. Uh, I know many of you, some of you have seen people who are even in the, uh, in the videos. Uh, I'm not used to doing talking in front of groups, and I'd like to tell you about my very first experience, which wasn't all that great. It was in third grade, and uh, the teacher called on me, and I had to give a report. And I went up there with my little yellow pad with the lines on it. You remember those in Spanish school. And it was on, I think, George Washington. And I'm reading, and the people in the front row are starting to giggle. And you know what I'm reading? Pretty serious. So I kept reading, and then the people in the second row started giggling, and the front row was laughing. And I kept on reading, and finally, the giggling goes all the way back. And finally, I stopped and said, what the heck is the matter? And some kid right in the first row pointed and said, your fly's open. <laughs> <laughs> My first experience. <laughs> the song you just heard, uh, Time to Say Goodbye, was by Sarah Brightman. At some time in your life, it hasn't already happened, there will come a time when it's time to say goodbye. And each and every one of you will choose to do it in a different way. This is how I chose to do it. It's her story, our story, 1965 to 1993. About 80 poems, 80 pictures, and 150 plus little short stories on things that occurred events during our life. I'd like to read the first acknowledgments in this because I think it's very important to acknowledge the people who helped her. Uh, I'd like to thank the people from the Maine Medical Center, uh, Mid Coast Hospital, uh, Maine Center for Cancer Medicine, and all the people for organizations working for cancer. Although the outcome wasn't what we had expected, uh, we thank them uh, for all the help they gave us. I'd like to start by reading from this one, the first paragraph. Now, during our lifetime, the book is also about all the things that we've done as families. The weddings, funerals, uh, birthdays, births, deaths, and also the animals we've had in our lifetime. We can we know a certain period in our lifetime because I had that dog during those 10 years, or I had a cat during those 10 years. The beginning. His name was Wally, or at least what, that's what we ended up calling him. He was no ordinary kitten, but then again, maybe he was. He certainly didn't do any brave deeds or bring attention to himself by doing tricks or acting smart. So how did this little five paw pound ball of fur make his way into our hearts. His story begins on June of 2000, but the whole story really starts in the mid-60s. Today we're not starting in the 60s, we're starting on a snowy Saturday afternoon in December of 1990. And Pinky said something to me that everybody else in here probably said that her husband or wife, she said, I'm gonna get the mail. I said, okay, I'm lying on the couch watching a good football game. And uh, she comes in. She is on cloud nine. She's smiling and she's laughing. I said, well, what made you so happy? And she said, a friend of mine wrote me a poem. And I lied there, laying there thinking, if I had known over 20 years that all it took was a poem <laughs> and it could make her that happy, I would have written her a poem. And then she said, I'm going to the store. Do you need anything? No, I didn't. And then what's happened to all of us happened to me. My mouth did a shortcut from my brain. And I said, while you're gone, I'll write you a poem. <laughs> Never written a poem before, but I'm going to write a poem in 30 minutes. So she goes, and I said, OK, what have I done? 
So I got a pen and pencil and went back on the couch and I got the remote control and I turned down the volume on the football game. I wasn't going to turn off a perfectly good football game to write a poem, you know. <laughs> so I'm thinking there, what can I write about? What can I write about that we've been married 22 years? What can I possibly say in those years? And I thought, well, I'm reflecting back. It's snowing outside. It's cold. But I thought about wet legs sitting on the beach on a nice, sunny, warm afternoon with the sun going down over the hills and the reflections on the water. And I thought, well, reflections. That's a, that's a nice title. And I wrote, the day's last ray of sunshine reaches out across the water. Colors fade into deepening shades of brown and gray. Thoughts of you, our love, life shared, our happiness, our sorrow. These are the reflections that linger in the portals of my mind. And I looked at that and I said, that's not too bad. Maybe I should write another one. That only took five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I reached up and I took the click and I turned the sound down a little bit more because the football game was really pretty good. And I'm thinking, well, what else can I write about? Well, at the time, the room was about 80 degrees because we had a fire going. And you know you can't turn down the heat on a vigilant fire stove, you know, wood stove. And I'm thinking, it's pretty warm in here. But she's a warm person. And I thought, well, what about what does warm have to do with her? And then I wrote over the next 10 minutes, warmth. The heat from the fire warmth my fingers and toes, like the warmth in your heart that kindled the fire in my soul. I said, hey, I'm on a roll. That's not too bad. I think maybe, uh, maybe I could even write another one. So I'm thinking, well, what is she to me? Now, what is your husband and your wife all to you? You're your spouse, they're your lover, they're, you could think of a hundred things. And I thought, well, really, what is she? They're your best friend. So what I did was I wrote my friend. Lying beside you, skin touching skin, caressing each moment, love comes from within. Caring and sharing, never doubting your word. You are my friend, through thick and thin. <coughs> and I thought, well, that's pretty nice. We'll see what she liked, if he liked it or not. And when she came home, I gave it to her, and she, was, she liked them. I didn't know how much it was I think it was Monday morning, Monday afternoon. And I got home and there was a present for me. And it was this, this little book full of empty pages. And I opened it up and there was a cross pen and pen set. She said, you should write. Four months, I filled it. Sometimes I'd wake up at night. Sometimes I'd write little jot things down during the daytime at work, and then I'd, I'd do it afterward. And then I finished this book in, in four months. And uh, there's some pretty good poems. It's all about, and I call it Reflections, Some Thoughts on Life and Love. After I finished this book, I really didn't know what else to do to write about. And then I thought, I looked and I saw my telescope sitting in the corner. Now, in 1989, uh, as uh, Southern Maine had a course in astronomy, and I decided I always liked astronomy, so I went ahead and I took the course. And afterward, I bought this telescope. It's an F4.5, 900 millimeter. Basically, it's an eight inches around. It's about that long. and I looked at a lot of things over the next couple of years. I could see all the planets, the nebulas, um, a lot of stars. And then I said, well, why don't I just take everybody on a journey through the universe? And it starts out pretty simply.
I'm off on a new adventure, the exciting as can be. So if you feel like joining, then come along with me. And basically, I take you through a ride through the solar system and explain all the planets and what happens all in verse. <coughs> and when I finish that, of course, now we have a long way to go to get to all these things because they're so far away. So we're going to go much faster than the speed of light. And scientists say you can't do that. But it's my book and we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and in the meantime, I've got about oh, 60 or 70 poems in the meantime until we get to the tour of the universe. One of them is uh, a strange compulsion. You see, I have this strange compulsion to write down what we think. And it doesn't seem to matter if it's good or if it stinks. I just hope that I'm lucky enough to find someone with a need. It's all a strange compulsion to sit right down and read. And we go on to uh, the heart. The heart is a pump that moves blood around to our organs and muscles that in our bodies abound. But in days of past, it played another role. People thought of it as the center of their soul. Today, with modern science, we say they weren't smart. But then, why when love fails, do we have a broken heart? And we move right along. There's a, really a variety of different and this one is really for married men only. <laughs> and the title is for married men only. For all we do in this great life, we are but poems in a game of life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, a lot of nice little poems in here. And then we get to the the tour. We've made it out to the stars, and now we're going to do a tour. But first, I have to tell you about creation. Creation. It all started billions of years ago with a colossal stellar sight, from a pinpoint in the darkness to a blinding flash of light. Scientists have a name for this. They call it the Big Bang, whose noise still reverberates throughout space with a faint clang. All we see and know of, and all that does exist, was born in one split second when fate took a sudden twist. And I tell about what a nebula is, stars, comet, star stuff. Star stuff is what we're made of, the building blocks of life, born in a super, a supernova of a, di a dying star's final strife giving witness to the theory that life will continue on in another time and another place long after we are gone. And then we do a comet and moon, a constellation, and then the theory of relativity. How many people here have been affected by the theory of relativity? I didn't expect anybody to raise their hand. <laughs> okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this, then I'm going to ask that question again. The theory of relativity. Relatively speaking, you think that Einstein knew what to say to relatives when he figured their visit was through. <laughs> was there a relative theory or a formula he didn't know? that he could recite without offending, so they'd know it was time to go. <laughs> How many people have been affected by the theory of relativity? <laughs> yeah, I, I have a story about that later. That's yeah, five weeks of it. And then we go into dark matter and the speed of light. The speed that light travels is so very fast. From deep in a star up to space that's so there. The light which we see in the night that is cast came from distant stars as they shone in the past. If you could ever travel much faster than light, 
then to see yourself coming would be quite a sight. <laughs> yeah, and then we're gonna end it all with a big question that everyone wants to know. Is there life on other planets? Life on other planets. If there's life on other planets more intelligent than our own, why haven't they made contact to make their presence known? Perhaps they're just too peaceful or maybe much too smart to think this world is ready for universal peace to start. And then we're on our way home. Now we got, we've been traveling for light years. We gotta get all the way home before summer. And then I leave you with about 60 more poems here. And the first is the boundary. Tomorrow is the first of forever of days yet to be. And yesterday is the last of forever of days we did see. And today is the boundary between the future and the past, where we live in the present. And just a blink gone by too fast. And we take that right down to coming home. And the value of love. Here's the end. I kind of like this. Love is unlike money that we use to pay the rent. It's not measure, measured by how much we save, but rather by how much of it spent. And a self portrait. All we do, all we say, and all the good we see are what we are, what we're not, and what we'd like to be. And then I end up with the end, and it tells you what the journey is really about. Now, after I finished this book, and this one was about a year and a half, I took a uh, creative writing class with uh, at SAD 75. And the instructor's name Lynn Gibbons Beto. Uh, the very first thing I did was we sat in there for an hour and then she let everybody go on a break and, and I said to her, uh, I don't think this is for me. And she said, why not? I said, well, I'm writing verse. I'm writing poetry you're doing is not that. She said, oh no, you just do all the assignments in verse. <laughs> and I did, and it was, it was a lot of fun. And just to let you know, there was a uh, person in the group, his name was James Moore. He was in the same group. He wrote Human Sacrifice, which is about the little girl who was killed in both and he was in the same group wondering how to write this book and, and everything. One of the side things on this about this uh, class was, uh, Lynn said one day, we're gonna go to Bowdoin College and we're gonna show you how to look up people or something because now we don't have to go to those drawers and you know, go through the index things. Now we can go to a computer and type in what we want. So I said, That's, yeah, we'll go there. We all went over. And she said, does anybody know anybody famous or uh, want us to look up somebody? I said, well, I know somebody who is famous in my family, Anthony Salerno. Actually, he was called Anthony Fat Tony Salerno. <laughs> uh, you'll know why when I tell you. Does anybody remember the name John Gotti? <laughs> John Gotti was the mafia boss of the Genovese family in New York, one of the five crime families in 1990. My uncle was the crime boss of the Genovese family in the 80s and 70s, 70s and 80s. And when I say the, uh, about staying too long, my aunt came up to Maine twice and stayed for five weeks. <laughs> and I wasn't gonna say, no, you have to go. <laughs> but anyway, to put it in perspective, I told her that, and she said, do you know that my father was a detective in New York City, and his job was to put away my uncle. 
she had to have a police escort every day back and forth to school because of it. That's how things were then. Anyway, uh, at about the same time, I started writing a third book, Impressions, and I started sending uh, out little flyers to all these publishers. Of course, every excuse you can think of. Poetry is not the thing right now. Uh, we have more than enough people that are writing for us. We're not looking for anybody new. So after a few months, I just gave that up. That was not a good idea. So I just kept writing, and I said, well, what am I going to do now? And I, I was watching television one night, and it was the Oscars, 1992, I think it was. And uh, the good-looking redhead came up, red, big red lips. And I just sat down and thought, what would I say about her? And I said, two thick ruby red lips on a face full of glow. A fine figure with a mind that doesn't know slow. Two eyes that inquire, do you like it, you see? I'd like to say, yes, my wife would kill me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to tell you who she was. You got to be a book find out. The second one, you're going to know. The next night, see, I didn't know I had a book. I just did that. And the next night, somebody else came up. And he was singing. And I said, what would I say about him? He sang of a rocky mountain high and of Calypso on the sea. He bore his heart nanny song for all the world to see. With a voice so crystal clear, a message his songs do send. I think that he's the kind of person who I'd like to call my friend. Everybody knows who that is. The next night, really, I'm share. I'm not going to read it because it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> she came out in Dungaree with Holden, and that's all I'm going to say about it. <laughs> but it was good. And let's see. Who else have I got <coughs> for you today? Somebody from Maine. He's the king of horror stories and tales that can chill your spine. <coughs> From pets and cars to graveyards, he writes pro prolifically, line after line. Though he looks kind of strange in commercials, meeting him would really be keen. I'd shake hands with the king of horror on any day but Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> he looked really strange in commercials about him when he was doing them. Though his body is trapped and confined to a chair, Thoughts are yet free to soar in the air. With a mind so brilliant, he can make quite a case. And they hold the answers to the secret space. You should know who that is. Yep, Stephen King. Nope. No? Oh, I thought you were something. Nope. You have her first name right there. Oh. Different guy. This is a nice little book on a coffee table. You can pick it up, you can challenge somebody, whip it open, and. Uh, Read one of these and see if they can guess it. He tweaked their interest in imagination in a field of dreams by building a lighted baseball field for two ghosts like baseball teams. He's a talented man of compassion with a humility that's more rare. He danced with wolf and Indian to show that we should care. The reason I wrote that was I was extremely impressed when he got the Oscar. He gave all the credit to his parents, and it was a really, really nice thing that he did. There was a time in this country when we called each other red. Till the lady from Maine stepped forward with a conscience, it is said. She made clear a declaration in this, the land of the free, that it is, it is the right of any citizen to disagree. You remember the 50s? And I, McCarthy, she stood up for him. Let's see now. Oh, the queen of midnight horror, all dressed so snugly in black, with much cleavage showing in the front, and a nice asset below her back. <laughs> I'd like to share her couch with her and give her cheek a peck, but I'm afraid that she would retaliate by biting me on the neck. <laughs> yeah. And we're going to end with, now this does have just to give you some other C.S., Dolly, Hawking, Lennon, Goldie, Demi, Clint, 
television. How many people only know? I only know one Hillary. That was way back. And by the way, just as a note, my 10th class reunion in New Jersey, the Lieutenant Governor of Arkansas was there. Everybody know who the Lieutenant Governor of Arkansas was in 1971? I didn't know this until about 10, 10, 15 years later when I saw him with his hair all bushed out. I said, hey, he was at our class again. <laughs> Of course, about five years ago, the girl that came with, he came with, uh, let everybody know it. <laughs> I'll tell you what she did for a living. But I don't. Okay, this is, a, huh, we'll do this one too. He's a man of modern science who saw too much suffering and pain, so he built a machine of suicide to help along the final refrain. Some say that of these killings, not to death, is really to blame, while others say with compassion, Dr. Mercy should be blamed. And the last one, I'm just going to tell the story behind this. Donna Skaya. I read this to our writing group, and they said, well, who is she? Who is she? And I said, gee, you know, that was 20 years ago. I forgot. <laughs> and uh, so I went on my computer and looked it up. And she was a Russian immigrant, came here in 1988, and she wanted to become an American citizen. It took five years, but she had cancer and didn't know if she would make it to the, to be able to, uh, to get the oath of citizenship. Well, they passed a bill in Congress which gave a waiver for five years, and President Clinton signed it. And as I read further, I found out why I wrote about her. She got the oath of citizenship, and she died three days later in Portland, Maine. That's why I wrote about her, because it came on our news. So I finished this, and then I, uh, after getting all those rejections, I tucked everything away in the bottom drawer for about 20 years, which a lot of people do. And uh, I didn't really do anything. And then I joined the writing group. And uh, in 2000, actually, I knew I was going to write this book. But it was all going to be about animals. That was until last year. And then all of the animals all of the animal stories are in here, along with all the other stories that happened from 65 to, to, to uh, 2013. And it starts out with us uh, getting engaged, tells all about that, breaking up, getting engaged, and getting married, and having children. And then I meant to bring in our robust little ivy. It's, I got three of them going now. It was actually from the wedding bouquet. It's still going, and I've got three of them going. And because uh, it was dying, and in the spring I took it down to a place, and and he put a put another pot next to it, and put part of it in, and it's been thriving ever since. And then we moved uh, to Jersey, and then we came back up to Maine because we couldn't do anything about housing there. And then we got into farmer's home loan after living in Lewiston for a year and a half, and we moved to Thompson. Well, the first week we were in there, Pinky nudged me and she said, there's somebody outside our window. And it hadn't snowed, but you could hear the crunching on the grass of the frozen grass. So I whipped out my dungarees and I ran over to the front door and I put one hand on the light foot and I went on the knob and at the same time I went, and there's this guy standing there. <laughs> in this hand, he's got a candelabra. All the candles are blown out. And his eyes are about this big. And I said, what are you doing here? And he looked at me. I don't know. <laughs> I said, you better get out of here and go back home. And I don't ever want to see you again or I'll call the police. Anyway, the next day I was driving home. And I uh, saw him and evidently four brothers and a bunch of guys, rough looking guys. I drove right in there and his mother was there and I asked him what he was doing. Well, you have to read the rest of it. <laughs> it was Calvin Osno. Oh. We live next door to the Osno. And if anybody knows the uh, 
Iona would be uh, as the Memorial Day. She would be what do you call it? Marshall. Grand Marshal. Very nice lady. Very nice. And there was nothing. He was a nice man who got really messed up with shot. And uh, I get into talking about the seasons and flowers and our animals. Uh, we had a dog first, and uh, then another dog and a rabbit, and there's stories in there about that. One day, the next door neighbor, big dog came over, was going to attack our rabbit. The rabbit was like sitting out in the middle of the, and our little dog, she was eight years old, ran right over, and stood right over him. And man, she let that other dog know that if he came any closer, he was going to have a new rear rent. <laughs> so he backed off and went. And uh, there were a lot of other things. She was working with a nurse. Then we had Jeffy with 125 pounds. And let's see, we did camping. We have camping in here. And grandchildren. I have a section on the children. And we were also separated for a year and a half. So things weren't always the smoothest. It was a time, tough time for her. Her mother had died. So she was turned 50. And uh, I guess she had to try things out. And a year and a half later, we were together. She came back again. We dated the whole time. It's in here. And that's when the cat started, because she had a cat. So we went from dogs to cats, because with leash laws and everything, dogs are very, became very hard. And so we have cats now. Now, one of the things she, was her hobbies, I'll tell you about her hobbies, was painting. And you'll notice that the, that was one of her. That's the front cover of Reflections. And we have holidays like, oh, Valentine's Day. Now on Valentine's Day, I used to make cards for her. And uh, then the crier one year was having a uh, contest. And Margaret and Bertie Pritzky were down the street from us. So I sent in this uh, poem, and it won. And we had, this stuff will all be up here to look at. It was called The Vow. We promise to love and honor so long as we do live but I'm not sure that's long enough for the love we have to give. We took that vow together on a wintry wedding day when we were young and innocent and believed what we did say. Now that I look back on it, the window felt the chime. I didn't ever think a love could outlast the end of time. And they gave us a dinner. The next year, I wrote another poem that year in Mount Washington, and WMTW was having a contest for a bouquet of flowers. And one day I was writing home again. Now, it was, the name of it was a Valentine Puzzle. And you can read about it in here, but the announcer said, and we'd like to thank everybody for entering our contest. And, and by the way, today we had one come in, and it came out, we opened the envelope, and it came out in pieces. So what I had done was cut it all around except for the main part of it. And evidently, it, uh, the receptionist got quite attached to it or broken up, and she took it into the office manager, and she sent me a nice letter. And a week later, we got a bouquet of flowers. <laughs> uh, birthdays were always a great thing. I did, uh, she needed glasses one time, so I didn't know what kind to get for glasses, so I made up a pair with $20 bills, <laughs> and she was able to do that. There were always nice little things that we uh, ended up doing. She ended up uh, being a caregiver for some people over in all the ladies in Pittsburgh. As they got elderly, she would be a caregiver for them, and when one died, the next one would grab her, and she would go with her, and she went with about four of them. And they loved her, and she was really good at it. And there's more animal stories. Halloween was always a great one. And the uh, Memorial Day, we were always on the bridge. In the early years, we had a handicapped daughter, and she was at Pineland. 
and we would go to Pineland for the parade and everything, and, and uh, then we'd go camping. And after we told the camper, then we would uh, go to the parade. And on the 4th of July, we would go to the uh, parade up at, in Bath. Now, I worked at the ironwork. And uh, one of the ships there was the uh, John Paul Jones. And I was working on it. And uh, I wrote a poem about it. It's called Night Watch on the John Paul Jones. There's a night watch on the John Paul Jones, the ship that bears its name, who fought forgotten country, gaining triumph and true fame. We honor his spirit and bravery as we launch this ship of steel and man it with our finest young men of courage, strength, and zeal. They'll fill the oceans of this world to preserve and strengthen the peace, while in the cause of freedom, may their efforts never cease. At night, each officer and seaman can put the rest in fright. For there's a night watch on the bridge commanding. I have not yet begun to fight. And we get into the seasons when pine needles turn brown. When pine needles turn brown in the fall of the year, the days get shorter, the nights cool and clear. Toys from summer are stored neatly away. Some birds have gone south, while others will stay. Chipmunks scurry around in search of winter food to stuff into their pouches, so not to be rude. Split wood from outdoors is stacked in the cellar. Maple and oak trees turn bright with color. Animals are wary of hunters on the prowl as bird dogs run off to, re to retrieve shot down fowl. These are some events the season does crown. It's that time of the year when pine needles turn brown. And we had turkeys. We made the mistake of feeding turkeys a few years ago. We started with seven, and then we had 14, and then we had 25, and a week later we had 50. In another week we had 100. <laughs> Not counting the deer who were standing there eating the cracked coin that we were throwing four bags of 40 pounds a week out. Because once we had started it, we couldn't really stop, stop it. Pinky was an adventurer. She went to Russia in the 80s with a medical group when she was in uh, up at Lake Tahoe where her son worked up there. She did the uh, parachute thing being pulled by a boat. She had to pan for gold. We couldn't go by the California River and not pan for gold. <laughs> yeah, and uh, then we went to the Silver City, or Virginia City, the city of Silver, and we bought some things there. And uh, for one of her biggest desires, which you saw up here a while ago, was to swim with a dolphin which she did in December. Uh, four months later, she died. One of the things that, one of her favorite little things was sea glasses. I've got bottles of this at home. This is a tough color, it's blue. We have red, we have white, we have green. And uh, so on Christmas one day, I bought her a book called The Secret Glass Chronicle. And I wrote a poem called The Sea of Love. Much like the glass that comes from the sea, with its surface and edges as smooth as can be, swept by the tide and buffed by the sand, till washed up on shore and caressed by a hand. Our love has grown stronger and richer through the years, seasoned with memories of laughter and tears. Most precious and treasured, on this we agree. Much like the glass that comes from the sea. Now, We're going to get into, in the end here, on oh, aging. We have to do aging first. We both felt the same about it. You know, age nicely, gracefully. And we were doing that. And I wrote this a long time ago. Wrinkles. Your face with all its wrinkles is so beautiful, you see. We've shared them all together through the years you've spent with me. Each and every wrinkle has a story of its own that we share together of how our love has grown. 
and I don't know if I should read this one. It's called Women. Okay. Tears she'll shed and not know why. It's the nature of her sex. Everything is all mixed up, like giving her this hex. She handles it as best she can, but you can lend a hand just by saying these two simple words. They are, I understand. And then we get into cancer. On uh, January 3rd, 2012, we thought she was having a heart attack, so we called the ambulance, and after they did all the tests, found out it was uh, lung cancer. And it was caused by smoking. Now, what I can tell you the odds, if you smoke, it's one out of three. Actually, it's a little higher. One out of three people, smokers, will get it. Of those, 85% are not going to make it. That's how high it is. 85%. When you think you have it licked like we did, what they don't tell you is, with all these statistics, is 50% of the time it comes back in the brain. And that's what happened. We got brain cancer. But it's still classified as lung cancer. So we went through the radiation, the hair loss, <coughs> everything else. And then the last day, and I happened to be in there alone on the last moment. And uh, the chapter's called She's Gone. And I wrote two poems. It's called The Last Goodbye and Wings. I'm not going to read those. You'll have to read those yourself. But I will read you what I wrote a long time ago about it, and it's called Strength. As we pass through the trial of life, we learn of many things, like peace and love and happiness and the joy that living brings. It rewards us with friends and family, not the treasures of the kings. And what holds it all together is a bond that I call strength. Now when it's time to leave this earth and to look death in the face, that's the time to cut the strings that hold us to this place. One by one we cut them from the ones we love, cutting ever nearer to the one above, leaving tears and sorrow along with grief and strife until the only string that's left is the string of life. The celebration was great. We had about 100 people showed up, and there were poems, and everybody got up and talked. And my son wrote a tremendous thing to his mother, page and a half. I'm only going to read one section of it. It's uh, better than I wrote. It's a terrific job. And I put this in there for him. Mom's greatest ability was how she related to others. It was unbelievable to watch her meet a complete stranger for the first time. And after five minutes, see them part like lifelong friends. Her sincere nature and sense of humor generated the warmest embrace, even from thousands of miles away. I often wonder what the world would be like if everyone, if everyone was capable of this. It's an amazing tribute. Now, when Pinky was young, she was very, very inquisitive. Uh, she wrote to a chocolate company, I think it was Hershey, and asked them why their candy bars were getting smaller. <laughs> and they wrote her back. They did. They wrote her back and uh, told her that because of price and everything else, it was uh, much more reasonable to make those bars smaller, and they were. She also wrote to a famous doctor. And uh, he responded, because she hated needles. She didn't like the taking needles at all. And he wrote back, Dear Margaret, by now you probably have received your polio inoculation and know that all your fears were for naught. You now know that worrying about how much it was going to hurt was much worse than the momentary prick. I am glad that you were perfectly willing to accept your mother's decision as to what was best for you and if not already, sometime soon, will know she was right. Sincerely, Jonas E. Falk. Can you look at 
that, I'll have that right up here. I have it on museum wear, so I don't want to get it broken. Uh, 1956, three cent stamp. <laughs> so. And now before we get into the very end here, how do we have to do the burial? I happen to be very fortunate in that we live two miles from the West Bowden Cemetery, and it's a private cemetery. So that means you can do everything yourself. Now when she died in March, we all know that she was cremated and you can't dig because the ground is broke. So my two sons and a friend and I went and we actually did it all ourselves. And people came, about 70 people, <coughs> relatives and friends. And everybody had something nice to say. We did some poetry. And my, her brother's new son from Scotland played the bagpipes. And he played two songs, one was Amazing Grace. The other was Highland Cathedral, which was a special song that during the medieval times, the Scots were beheaded if they were caught by the English for playing it, because it was to honor somebody who was very well respected, and he played that for her. And as we were, I told everybody to go back to the house, we were gonna have a big cookout, and nobody left. They all waited until everything was done. And we had the grass back in, and we all went home, and we had volleyball games, the kids played in little pools, and uh, we had a cookout, and everybody had a great time, just like she wanted. I gave away 90% of her jewelry to first her granddaughters, and then her sisters, and then aunts, and anybody related, and any clothing, articles of clothing, scarves, all went. I still have quite a bit left, but uh, everybody appreciated getting, they wanted something from her. And the cemetery I like this poem because it's an old cemetery that we have there and it's called Old Versus New. An old cemetery has a spirit that a modern one lacks with its newly paved roadways and engraved copper plaques. Like the old spiked iron railings and narrow dirt roads where dandelions and wildflowers flower, enjoy the croaking of toads. Hidden away snugly on some lonely country way where it's quiet and peaceful throughout the whole day unlike those built on highways or next to airports, buried in noise and pollution and commuter traffic reports. Then I do a little thing called divine thinking, which everybody wonders, and you'll have to read that yourself. Before I finish the last two, I just want to tell you that 20% of all the proceeds today from all the books, and that's gross proceeds, whatever we make today, will go toward here, and I'm putting another percentage toward cancer research. I just got some things at home, so that's going to help that. Uh, each of these books, other ones, they're normally $11.95 or $14.95. They're going to be $10 each. So for $25, you can have two, for three, for $35, and all four for only $40. That's $10 a piece if you would like to. I thought Frank's books were going to be better with Frank's book back there. Pardon? Did I don't see Frank's book. Oh, I thought we were going to have Frank's back there okay. too. Okay. okay, we're going to have a Frank and our book, which was last chat with uh, uh, the group book for the writing group. And together, they're $25 for both of them. So all the proceeds from those books go toward people play. Now, the end here, Sands of Time, if you've noticed this little picture, a friend of hers, who she worked her, for her mother, they have a ceremony they do out in Pittsburgh. And they did the ceremony, she took the picture, and she wrote it on the back here. And I wrote about that ceremony, and I also wrote a poem about it, and again, I'll have to get to, it, to read it. And people ask me, how do you cope? Well, the very last poem in here is how I cope and how other people may look at the death of a loved one. And you'll have to read about that yourself. <laughs> but let me tell you one final story. A person goes up 
at one of these and buys a book and he opens it to the back and he starts reading and the author looks at him and he says, what are you doing? He says, I'm reading the last page. And the author says, well, why are you reading the last page? He says, well, in case I should die before I finish the book, I'll know how it ended. <laughs> so I can, all I can say is, please don't die before you finish reading the book. <laughs> Read it from the front, there's another reason to. And that's in a poem I call The Chance of a Lifetime. If I had a chance of a lifetime, you see, to know exactly what my future would be, I'd consider very carefully what I should do before deciding to carry it through. I remember how pleased I was reading a book, chapter by chapter, while getting a look at the excitement and glory a story to bridge instead of just reading the very last page.